Yeah, I know NASA do a lot of amazing things, but how do they affect me, personally? Anyone working in a technical role has been presented with that question. Just replace NASA with any other relevant, preferably publicly funded research agency. And it is, for want of a better phrase, rage-inducing. It's a difficult question to respond to. Non-technical but well-meaning people often respond with overly enthusiastic accounts of how NASA invented Velcro or memory foam mattresses or some other equally tangible but minor or unconvincing example. NASA didn't invent those, by the way. Other people will try and present arguments about unintended benefits, as if research agencies just spend their time randomly guessing and throwing money at whatever takes their fancy until something sticks. A third group will give a hand-waving pseudo-philosophical lecture about marching forward and discovery making us human. I used to be in that group, by the way. Having spent five years working for a government-funded research institute, the truth is, most inventions and discoveries are incredibly boring. They're incremental, and it's difficult to quantify how they affect your day-to-day -day life. Today, we're going to discuss a project that was most certainly not boring. It was not invented by accident, and it has improved your life, probably without you even realising. Let's learn the story of how NASA developed a computer 10 years ahead of its time, used it to fly to the moon, then crammed it into an obsolete fighter jet and invented the digital fly-by-wire. My last video was highly critical of Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 2 and one of my main criticisms was a lack of a fly-by-wire system. As I've mentioned before, I always like to follow a critical presentation with one that presents an example of how it was done properly. So, to begin, let's learn about rods and cables. Small and or old aircraft have a direct linkage between the cockpit controls and the control surfaces. In the simplest case, this can just be cables on pulleys, in more complex cases, push rods can be used along with various linkages to effectively transfer force between the pilot and the surfaces. Casual observers often take comfort in such a system. No room for failures, right? We'll get back to that in a bit. However, as soon as your aircraft becomes larger or faster, those control surfaces also grow and the airflow moving over them necessitates more and more force to actuate them. Beyond a certain size and speed, the pilots need help, and that's why hydraulic controls were introduced. Hydraulic controls are also pretty simple in principle. Now the cockpit controls are connected to a hydraulic system. This system pumps fluid to and from hydraulic rams on the control surfaces to actuate them so the pilot no longer has a direct link to the control surfaces, but the hydraulic actuators can easily move those surfaces, eliminating the need for the pilot to keep on top of their workout schedule. So far, the control systems discussed operate in a fundamentally simple way. If the pilot moves the control yoke, or stick, to the left, what happens? The plane rolls left? Kind of, but not really. Moving the yoke left moves the left aileron upwards and the right one down. That's it. So the plane rolls left? But hold on, we've now got one wing moving upward through the airflow and one downward. So the wings are now providing a different amount of lift and actually in different directions as well. When left unchecked, this causes the aircraft to yaw against the direction of the roll. And it doesn't stop there. Our lift vector isn't pointing straight up anymore, so we're getting less lift against the direction of gravity, so the aircraft will tend to pitch down, which also means our airspeed's probably going to increase. That's quite a simplified explanation, but anyone who's flown a light aircraft will know when you move one of the controls, you usually have to move at least one other to compensate for these secondary effects. And, and yeah, that was just one example. The main point here is that for basic control systems, moving the controls in the cockpit does not move the aircraft. It moves the control surfaces. And that's taxing on the pilot. It increases their workload and increases the chance of human error. There are some additional pretty major disadvantages to these hydromechanical systems. They're heavy and more weight 
means less fuel, armaments, or paying passengers, depending on your application. Because humans can't respond particularly quickly to changes, the control surfaces require more authority to account for this. Bigger control surfaces means bigger actuators and bigger support structures, so even more mass. And for military applications, hydraulic lines are vulnerable to battle damage. There are certainly measures that can be taken to mitigate these effects. In the first case, engineers try to build aircraft with inherent stability. This refers to the tendency of an aircraft to, re to retain its orientation if the controls are released. In some cases and some flight scenarios, aircraft will actually return to straight and level flight with no pilot input. There are various means to achieve stability, such as dihedral wings, proper position of the center of gravity, and a large flat tailplane. Those three examples ensure roll pitch and yaw stability in that order. Secondary control effects can be mitigated by clever design of control surfaces. We'll see an example in a second. Or even by interlinking controls if you want to add more mass to your control system. Other physical measures are possible, but we won't go into detail here. Oh, sorry, you wanted to go supersonic. Well, that adds a lot more complexity. So I won't go too far out of my lane here. I've fought plenty of fluid mechanics problems in both my education and career, but supersonic fluid flow has always been a bit of a dark art to me. An aircraft that's stable in supersonic flight is often unstable in subsonic flight. Remember dihedral wings? Those are inefficient at best and unstable at worst when going supersonic. And the same often goes for that big tailplane. And when airflow over your control surfaces is a mix of supersonic and subsonic, that can lead to a whole host of unpredictability. And, you guessed it, instability. Some aircraft are able to change the geometry and fly in different configurations for subsonic and supersonic flight. And again, clever design of control surfaces and other ancillary systems can help. To demonstrate, let me just go and get a Sidewinder tail fin. I was told about these years ago by a former F-16 and Tornado pilot, and I've always wanted an excuse to get one. So, this is a tail fin from a Sidewinder. You can see how it would sit here. Now, when you fire your missile, it needs to pitch and yaw around to track and manoeuvre to its target. And it needs to do that fast. But you don't really want it to roll. Since Sidewinders are designed to fly in excess of Mach 2, a small movement in any axis is likely to induce a roll for the reasons we've already discussed. So, how to prevent this? A digital flight control system can easily deal with this today. But the solution devised in the 1950s was pretty elegant. See this pivoting section at the top of the fin? That unlocks when the rocket motor fires. The latch here just unlocks thanks to the acceleration force. That allows this tab to pivot. Okay, and on this tab is this, an inertia flywheel. Airflow is guided down here and onto the veins of the wheel, causing it to spin up. Let's spin it up and see what happens. Okay, so that's our missile in level flight. Now let's try and enter a roll. Ah, so as the fin, and therefore the missile as a whole, rotates, this tab stays in place. It does that because the flywheel's acting as a gyroscope, resisting rotation perpendicular to its own axis of rotation. But now the tab's sticking out into the oncoming airflow, so, the airflow will push the fin as a whole in the opposite direction, resisting the tendency of the missile to roll. Here, let me demo it a couple more times just so we can see exactly what's going on. I'll put the original audio in too because this thing certainly makes a noise. This is obviously really elegant. I love it. Unfortunately, it's not really possible to design mechanical stability enhancements like this for every flight case and for every vehicle. Besides, the weight and cost would be prohibitive too. But it's extremely cool nonetheless. <laughs> 
Most modern supersonic aircraft are inherently unstable. That's the reason most of them look really ugly. Yeah, I said it. Fight me. They can't even be flown unaided by a human pilot. Less stability means more manoeuvrability, which is a necessary requirement for a lot of military aircraft. So, without some kind of artificial assistance, a pilot must constantly account for secondary control effects. They must navigate a flight envelope through unpredictable transonic regions in many cases. If they're carrying passengers, any movement they make will be felt by those on board. They must make sure they don't make any inputs that exceed the airframe rating. They must do their best if they encounter turbulence, despite not being able to react fast enough to keep the flight relatively smooth, and make the wrong inputs for whatever fleshy, unpredictable human brain reason, and you could find the ground coming to meet you at an alarming rate. And engineers need to spend significant time and expenditure on ensuring aircraft stability under all possible flight conditions. They often need to compromise on maneuverability for stability, They may need to add heavy and expensive secondary control surfaces for the transition to supersonic flight. Always more mass. More mass, more cost, more fuel. Wouldn't it be nice to get a little help? The problems discussed so far really came to a head in the late 1950s. With various militaries developing supersonic fighters the US experimenting with rocket planes, and the French and British developing a supersonic airliner. Some kind of computer assistance was required. Problem was, digital computers that could fit into an aircraft didn't really exist. But analogue ones did. Now, this video is pretty in-depth already, so I don't think I can do a deep dive into analogue computers. I recommend visiting Curious Mark's channel. Not only does he disassemble an analog flight computer from the 1960s, but he also restored an Apollo guidance computer to working condition again. Yes, you heard that right. Go visit his channel. Anyway, a one paragraph summary. There are various paradigms for analog computers. Mechanical, electric, slide rules, many others. Analog fly-by-wire computers generally consisted of electrically driven gear trains connected to external sensors. The outputs from the gear trains would produce a voltage to drive hydromechanical actuators to assist with control surface actuation. Generally, the pilot would still have direct access to the control surfaces through a hydraulic linkage, but the outputs from the analog computer would assist by trimming the surfaces to help with stability. I'll leave it with that brief summary. For more, go check out Curious Mark. He knows what he's talking about. I don't. To build a digital fly-by-wire aircraft control system, however, we first needed to go to the moon. A particularly tired statement we've all heard time and time again is, We went to the moon on less computing power than is available in your phone. That's a bit like saying, your car has a more powerful engine than the Wright Brothers flyer. Yes, it has a more powerful engine, but it can't fly. You could technically probably replace the gearbox and add a propeller and add wings and force it to fly, but it'd be easier just to build a plane. Keeping this chapter concise is truly a challenge. The Apollo spacecraft carried two identical computers, the Apollo Guidance Computers, or AGCs as we'll refer to them. They were developed by a team at the MIT Charles Stark Draper Laboratory. We'll refer to them as the Draper Team. These computers have been the subject of utter fascination to me for years. There's nothing I can really say to convey how far ahead of its time the AGC was, but I'll give a quick summary here and post a ton of more detailed sources in the description. I think it's best to start off by asking what did the guidance computer actually do? At its heart, the computer told the Apollo astronauts and ground crew, and yes, it automatically sent data back to Houston, where they were in space and where they were going. The computer was connected to an inertial measurement unit, or IMU. 
This was a three-axis gyroscope and three perpendicularly mounted accelerometers. The IMU therefore provided six output voltages, each proportional to either an acceleration in one axis or the rotation of the spacecraft in an axis. By interpreting data from the IMU, along with the proximity radars and other peripherals, the current velocity, orientation and position of the spacecraft could be resolved. This is known as the spacecraft's state vector. And by solving a series of differential equations, commonly referred to as the equations of motion, the future state vector could be predicted. If this all sounds very, the missile knows where it is because it knows where it is not, that's because that's what it is. State vector calculation was far from the only requirement for the AGC though. The pilot controls in both the command module and the lunar lander, or LEM, could not be directly connected to the thrusters. It's impossible for a human operator to manually fly the craft. So human inputs were passed through the computer, which controlled thrust and gimballing of the thrusters and engines. Many of the manoeuvres were pre-programmed, so to perform a translunar injection burn, for example, the astronauts would ask the computer to run the relevant program, and it would automatically orient the spacecraft and burn for the required time. It kept the communications array aligned with the ground stations on Earth. It disciplined state vector calculations using regular fixes from the ground radar and from astronaut inputs, which were derived from a sextant, by the way. The computer also handled incoming and outgoing data to and from Houston, and was able to provide additional information to the crew of Apollo via a numeric display. That display itself was also far in advance of anything else in existence at the time. Known as the DISCI, which is short for Display and Keyboard, it allowed crew to input programs and parameters through a numeric keypad and provided an output on an electroluminescent display. The segments on the display were actuated via relays. I would do anything to get hold of an original DISCI, but that's never going to happen. But... I do have a kind of knockoff disky myself here that I built. When you can't get hold of vintage Apollo hardware, just use Soviet equipment. Mine uses IAL display modules, which were produced in far greater numbers. In fact, similar modules were actually used in early iterations of Soyuz to display some outputs from its flight computer. My display uses optocouplers instead of mechanical relays, but same principle. In fact, here's my program for displaying an output on the display. Note the unusual design, which is actually capable of displaying all the letters of the alphabet along with the numbers. The AGC had to run its own subroutine for disky output too, just another necessary function. In fact, it also converted its metric calculations to imperial units for the display. That raises a fundamental question. The AGC was required to perform multiple tasks, often simultaneously. How was this possible? The answer is a particularly advanced prioritization and interrupt system called the executive. This was really just an operating system written in assembly language that was able to initiate, monitor, and terminate individual programs or jobs. Up to seven jobs could be run simultaneously with a complex prioritization schema ensuring compute time was directed at the most important job. Jobs could be reprioritized and added to or from the schedule. For basic jobs, a small amount of erasable memory called a core set was allocated, along with a priority, which was just a numeric value saved in memory, and the executive would monitor these code sets to ensure higher priority jobs were run first. For simpler tasks, this was fine, but try solving a differential equation using only assembly language, where your instructions are limited to basic arithmetic, checking and moving data from one place to another, and sending things from to input and output. Of course, these days we write almost everything in higher level languages, where many more instructions are available, but that's at the cost of significantly more physical resource usage. The Draper team did indeed develop a high-level language for the AGC, with over, over 120 instructions, 
but how to run it on a machine with such limited memory and compute. These interpretive jobs, as they were called, required a subroutine in the executive to call a virtual processor. The virtual processor took high-level instructions and ran them directly on the AGC hardware, effectively converting them to binary code on the fly. This not only allowed for the use of a higher level language, which was much easier to program in and to verify, but it allowed programmers to simulate hardware that did not physically exist in the machine, such as the ability to handle complex data types. So, a virtual processor existing entirely in software, but simulated in assembly language on the physical hardware, while obscuring that hardware from the programmer. Do you see what this is? It's a virtual machine. The AGC could run virtual machines as part of its individual jobs in a real-time system in the 1960s. Honestly, I don't really have any words for how much that amazes me. The various programs and their associated subroutines were compiled into a single block of monolithic code. This lived in the AGC's main read-only memory. 36,000 words of this fixed memory were available. Each word was 16 bits. Want to see what 36k of memory looks like? Here you are. By the way, that is Margaret Hamilton. She was head of the team at the MIT Draper Lab that wrote and tested the code for the AGC. She basically invented modern software engineering. She literally coined the term software engineering. I can't possibly do justice to how influential her work was. So, back to the program code. 36k of memory looked like this in the computer. Core rope memory. Tiny toroidal magnets woven onto copper wire. Applying a voltage to the appropriate pair of wires returned a high or a low voltage on the third wire depending on whether the pair were woven through or around one of the ferrite cores, each core storing one bit of code. In addition, there were 2,000 words of erasable memory in the magnetic core memory. This is the equivalent of RAM in a modern-day machine. This was mainly used to store variables, but could also be used to store subroutines, allowing for some flexibility in the function of the computer. During flight, Houston could even upload instructions to this erasable memory. So yeah, obviously your phone has more compute power than the AGC, and technically it could guide a spacecraft to the moon, but you'd have to somehow interface it with dozens of external peripherals. If you wanted any semblance of reliability, you'd have to wipe the operating system and probably end up writing an interpreter in machine code to run your actual actual code in whatever language you chose. You'd have to worry very hard about things like interrupts, memory management, and proprietary hardware and software, which is on your phone right now. And you'd have to think about radiation hardening, cooling, restart management, signal interference. I don't even know how many other factors. In the end, it'd probably be easier just to build a new computer. With digital fly-by-wire for spacecraft very much flight-proven through the Apollo program, a team at the Dryden Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base in California was formed to repeat the achievement for a fixed-wing aircraft. Okay, so a technicality arises here. The Dryden team weren't actually about to build the first aircraft with digital fly-by-wire. That honor goes to the Lunar Lander training vehicle, shown here almost killing Neil Armstrong. But I think we can all agree that the Lunar Lander training vehicle and the fixed-wing aircraft belong to entirely separate classes. The first hurdle was to obtain funding from NASA headquarters. This was made somewhat simpler by having Neil Armstrong personally advocate for the project and suggesting the use of the AGC. When asked of the reliability of handing over control of an aircraft to a computer, he famously said, I just went to the moon with one. The entire concept of adapting a guidance computer from a spacecraft to perform the only partially related task of flying an aircraft 
may sound far-fetched at first, but as we'll see, the differences are not necessarily as stark as you may assume. One million dollars was granted for the first year of the program. You'll note this isn't particularly much, even in 1970s money. As such, Dryden searched for either a cheap or free aircraft, with the final choice being an F-8 Crusader picked out of the Navy's aircraft boneyard. In fact, they actually acquired four of them, but we'll get to that. And with that, the Flight Research Centre set themselves the following key goals. Number one, no mechanical backup. This was to be the first flight of an exclusively digital fly-by-wire fixed-wing aircraft. Number two, no changes to the AGC hardware. This ensured the prior QA and validation could be inherited with no recertification necessary. Number three, a simple pilot interface. The fly-by-wire was to be a seamless link between pilot and control surfaces. Number four, no loss of aircraft handling qualities as a result of the modifications. The F-8 is a somewhat forgotten fighter today, as it's since been overshadowed by its more capable, yet significantly uglier successor, the F-4. It was a supersonic carrier aircraft, nearing retirement with the Navy at the start of the fly-by-wire program. Aside from being available to the Dryden team for essentially free, the F-8 had the advantage of equipment bays directly behind the pilot. These had previously been used for the aircraft's primary armament, four guns and their associated ammunition. In fact, the F-8 was the last US aircraft to use guns as its primary armament, though the historical record shows they weren't actually used very often. With the guns and ammunition stripped out, the bay proved ideal for installation of the guidance computer and its ancillary systems. The next systems to strip out were the hydraulic and mechanical controls, obviously. All direct mechanical and indirect hydraulic linkages between the cockpit and control surfaces were removed, to be replaced by power lines and signal lines from the guidance computer. Cockpit controls were connected to transducers that converted their movement to voltages, fed as inputs to the AGC via I.O. circuitry. The calculated outputs from the AGC were fed through digital to analogue converters, giving analogue voltage values that determined the deflection of newly installed electrical actuators. These drove hydraulic power actuators, which controlled the position of the surfaces. Crucially, there was no longer a real-world link between pilot and control surface. The cockpit controls only interacted directly with the guidance computer, and it was the guidance computer alone that decided how to interpret these interactions and move the control surfaces accordingly. The computer itself sat on a specially built pallet located here, just behind the cockpit. The pallet also housed the IMU, shown here. As one of the goals of a fly-by-wire system is to be effectively invisible to the pilot, there was no reason to force them to interact directly with the guidance computer, so the disky was located here accessible by ground crew for program initiation and outputting of post-flight data. Other peripherals and interfacing hardware were also housed in this gun bay. A simpler display was added to the cockpit for the pilot. This was the mode selector display. In the early stages of testing, the aircraft was to be flown in direct mode, where control inputs would just drive control surfaces directly. It was only later in the program where the full secondary effect compensation programs would be run. This panel allowed the pilot to switch between modes, along with allowing them to increase or decrease various parameters to alter control sensitivity. Later on in the program, the pilot's central control column was replaced with a smaller side stick, which is a standard setup for fly-by-wire aircraft today. Accounts from the time state the biggest challenge in installing the computer was actually cooling it. The AGC was cooled on Apollo through its highly conductive housing through a liquid glycol cooling loop with heat dumped to space via an external heat sink. I'd have thought this would be easy to replicate on the F-8, especially considering it drew an impressively minuscule 55 watts. But I could not be more wrong. 
I suppose you can't just stick a heat sink in the airflow of a fighter jet. Instead, the glycol cooling loop dumped heat into a liquid nitrogen cool sink. Really feels like overkill for 55 watts, doesn't it? But it clearly wasn't. And following several design iterations, the team eventually signed off on a max flight time of 1 hour and 20 minutes for the system. Draper Lab, who developed the AGC, happily provided engineers to rewrite the software for the F-8. Much as was the case with Apollo, the guidance computer was required to take inputs from an IMU to resolve the current and future state vector of the aircraft. In addition, it needed to run subroutines to maintain stability and aircraft performance limits and record data for subsequent analysis. It needed to act on program outputs by actuating the various control surfaces via the computer's output interface. This is really not too far from the guidance requirements of Apollo, and in many ways it was actually simpler, since it did not have to account for multiple frames of reference and the complexities of orbital mechanics. As such, approximately 60% of the Apollo code was recycled for use in the fly-by-wire implementation. This was made even more efficient due to the modular nature of the Apollo code, and inheriting individual modules also allowed the Dryden team to inherit the associated quality checks that came with them. This is a principle familiar to all modern day software engineers. Physically getting the software onto the AGC was yet another highly controlled process. The software started off on punch cards that were converted to rope core modules, with various parity and function checks performed throughout the process. Even more dauntingly, the team had only one shot at this. The rope weaving facility was planned to permanently shut down soon after the start of the F8 program. But with only one shot at writing the code, how was it possible to debug it? How about unit testing? And yes, the Draper team was so advanced they spoke of unit testing and continuous development in the 1960s. The software verification process began by solving the necessary equations and checking the solutions behaved as expected using an analog simulator. Now this simulator produced graphical outputs which could be compared to the expected behavior. The equations were then converted to program code, which was run on various digital simulators, depending on the nature of the code. Remember, digital mainframe computers were available, and they had eras erasable memory for program code. Only the AGC required the code to be in physical hardware format. Much of the code verification at Draper was performed on an IBM 360 mainframe. To further verify code prior to a test flight, a more application-specific simulator was required. Remember how I said a total of four F8s were, were acquired by Dryden? One of those was used to construct a specialised simulator, the Iron Bird. This was a one-to-one -one hardware copy of the actual fly-by-wire aircraft. It had its own AGC, which was actually certified to be used as a backup in the case the computer in the test aircraft needed replacing. However, the Iron Bird AGC was connected to a erasable memory, allowing the staff to run and test custom programs without having to manufacture rope memory modules for every test. The Iron Bird was then connected to simulation hardware, which would feed its instruments various data to simulate a flight. The resulting positions of the control surfaces, which were controlled and moved according to the programs on the AGC, were monitored by a hybrid computer, which contained differential analyzers. Those, I presume, would be the analog part in hybrid, along with digital logic gates. This was used to simulate the position and state of the simulated aircraft. This state could then be fed back into the simulation hardware, forming a closed loop. Closing the loop allowed operators to perform a real-time simulation of flight behavior, as each change made by the program was fed back into the controls, simulating the aircraft's change in position over time. This process was iterative. The first software test revealed a problem with vibration of the control surfaces. Control sampling took place every 30 milliseconds, with subsequent calculations performed in about 10 milliseconds. Each cycle moved the control surface as one step, but this approximately 40 millisecond cycle caused vibrations, 
so a more appropriate frequency was found in the simulator using trial and error, and fed back to the Draper team for inclusion in the final code. Eventually, with the software finalised, the rope core modules were manufactured, permanently fixing the software into hardware. However, remember the 2000 words of erasable memory in the AGC? They were left available for parameter changes and any necessary minor corrections to the code. As an example, mechanical aircraft have a dead band near the stick neutral position. This had to be replicated in the F8 fly-by-wire to prevent tiny movements of the stick during level flight being magnified into real-world movements. The dead band was tuned iteratively in the simulator, along with other flight characteristics. So, in summary, software was produced by solving the equations of motion for various states and situations. Then the behaviours were translated into digital code. This code was tested on a variety of analogue and digital mainframe computers. The code was then shipped to Dryden and tested on the Iron Bird simulator. Of course it wasn't a straight run through every time, with bugs and software issues found in the simulators requiring code reviews and rewrites. But for its time, the software development was unmatched in its meticulousness and consistency. The entire process is covered in a publication from Draper Lab, which I've included in the sources. As we keep reiterating here, the major challenge with fly-by-wire is reliability. During the 1950s, the proposed overarching method for reliability in analogue and subsequently digital flight systems was redundancy. In the case of the AGC, hardware redundancy was simply not possible. The additional mass and operating needs of the redundant components, in this case entire computers, was unacceptably high and couldn't really be installed in the F8 so a different approach was used, utterly rigorous QA testing. The manager of the Draper F8 team said at one point, every piece of metal in the computer could be traced to the mine it came from. Of course this is one of the reasons the AGC was so expensive to develop, but during both Apollo and the F8 test flights, not a single AGC had a single failure at any point. And for those who want to point out the computer reset on descent to the moon and Armstrong had to fly it manually. That is a myth. The computer performed exactly as it was supposed to. I'll link a video below that comprehensively dispels that. Despite the relative reliability of the AGC, I think any self-respecting pilot or engineer would be reluctant to fly without a backup. After all, it was very much still a single point of failure. This even applied during Apollo, the AGC in the LEM could be used to a very limited extent, and it indeed was used during Apollo 13, in the case of the command module computer being unavailable. And the lunar lander itself also had a backup abort computer. The Dryden team decided to install an analogue backup in the remaining gun bay, which would be capable of taking over in the case of an AGC failure, or indeed in the case the AGC began producing spurious outputs. The backup system was taken from the X-24A, one of a series of lifting body research vehicles previously tested at Dryden. Personally, I think the level of redundancy for what was a test vehicle is impressive, and much credit is due to the team for ensuring their test pilots came home at the end of every test flight. The analogue system consisted of three individual redundant computers, and we'll go over redundancy modes towards the end of the video. This wasn't installed in isolation to the AGC though, it was interfaced with it. So if the AGC began giving commands that were contradictory to the three analogue computers, control would be automatically switched over to the analogue backup. Now you may ask, why not just leave that choice to the pilot? But it doesn't take much imagination to envisage a situation where the AGC sends faulty commands far faster than a pilot could react and, you know, sends him spinning to the ground in the worst case scenario. So failover had to be automatic for the systems to have true redundancy. Regardless, this functionality was never required. As was the case with Apollo, the AGC performed flawlessly throughout the entire test program. With the challenge of developing and building a working system complete, the next and arguably more difficult challenge began – 
convincing the world it was safe and practical. Good software development and contingency design only goes so far. By May the 25th, 1972, it was time for a test flight. And the first test flight of the digital fly-by-wire system was a true step change. Remember, the mechanical and hydraulic interfaces had long since been removed. The F8 was flyable solely through the digital computer, albeit with the analog backup still present. The first flight was undertaken by Gary Cryer and lasted a total of 48 minutes. Several subsequent flights throughout the summer of 1972 tested the system at higher speeds and altitudes and performed increasingly ag aggressive manoeuvring. In addition, the ability to revert to the analogue backup system was also comprehensively demonstrated. However, these early flights were all in direct mode, meaning control surfaces responded directly to inputs as in a mechanical system. No compensation for secondary effects, stability augmentation or envelope protection was provided by the system in direct mode. By late August, the team was ready to test fly the configuration in Stability Augmentation Mode, or SAS, to demonstrate the full capability of the fly-by-wire system. This had been somewhat delayed due to a generator failure during taxiing for a previous flight. However, the flight was successful, and the Draper team had actually used the time to tune some of the parameters in the erasable memory to improve the handling characteristics of the aircraft, reportedly with much success. Of course, the test program encountered a number of hitches. In addition to the stability augmentation mode, the system also had a command augmentation mode, or CAS. This was designed to smooth out oscillations in the pitch direction and help prevent pilot-induced oscillations, or PIO. These occur when a pilot repeatedly overcompensates for an input and puts the aircraft into an oscillation. Fly-by-wire systems are particularly sensitive to PIO, as any significant delay between the pilot input and surface actuation tends to lead to overcompensation. When testing the cap capabilities of the SAS and CAS systems, PIO proved to be a significant issue on the F-8, leading to PIO in the roll axis on multiple flights. There are accounts of pretty eye-opening PIO incidents when pilots were in final approach for landing on a couple of test flights. These oscillations were indeed caused by an unacceptable delay between input and actuation, and required a small hiatus in the flight program to rectify. It should be noted, pilots reported the CAS system, however, was able to damp turbulence from the moment it was first tested. Following attempts at remediating the PIO issues, another alarming issue reared its head. By now it was April 1973, and following a test flight to evaluate the performance during high G manoeuvres, the ailerons were seen to fully deflect in opposite directions during shutdown on the runway. This was alarming as it had lead to a full rate roll if it happened in flight. It was traced to an incorrect variable in the erasable memory, the next flight saw the fly-by-wire switch to direct mode three seconds before landing, which is not a situation any pilot wants. This was traced to low hydraulic pressure in the actuators. The final test flights of the system involved fitting a side stick to the cockpit. By this point, the Air Force were nearing readiness for their F-16 prototype, the YF-16. They wished to use results from the digital fly-by-wire aircraft as part of their design process, and one of the requirements for the F-16 was to use a side stick. In the case of the AGC-controlled F-8, the side stick was only ever connected directly to the backup analogue system and remained as a backup test control, with primary control provided via the existing central control column. Six flights with the side stick proved it to be a, a workable design, and the results were passed on to the YF-16 team for incorporation in their design. The final six flights of the system, concluding in November 1973, were familiarisation flights for four new pilots. All significant issues with the system had been ironed out by this point, and test pilots reported handling was better than a conventional F-8. Philip Estrescher, the chief pilot for the YF-16, flew the F-8 twice, and referred to the NASA team as a bunch of real pros. In total, 
the AGC controlled F8 had flown 42 flights and had very much achieved the four objectives set out by the team. And I must stress again, although there were issues encountered during the test flight program, the AGC itself performed flawlessly throughout, never deviating from its program behaviour at any point. The findings were used to advance the program to a lengthier and more comprehensive second phase. But first, let's go off on a quick tangent. Okay, this is one heck of a digression, but I couldn't help myself. See that weird font on the side of the cockpit for the word digital? What is that? Obviously, it was a stylistic choice in this case, but you've probably seen something similar in artwork trying to look futuristic and modern for its day. I don't know why it caught my eye, but after a little bit of reverse image searching, it turns out that font is derived from another font called Westminster, which was designed in the 1960s to be both human and machine readable. And it's really simple. Documents would be printed in magnetic ink, and a reader consisting of a magnetic sensor, just like a head in a cassette tape reader, could be passed over the text. Each letter has a unique combination of thick and thin sections, giving a unique pattern for each letter, making the text readable by a computer. Now, even more mind-blowing, to me anyway, I read that it's still used on checks. I mean, does anyone still use checks? But amazingly, I still have a checkbook. It's been hidden at the bottom of my documents drawer for more than 10 years, unused. I mean, look at the state of it. But open it up, and there we are. Retro-futuristic human and machine-readable text. Okay, back to fly-by-wire. With the Apollo Guidance Computer fly-by-wire test program concluded, Dryden moved on to phase two of the program. This involved replacing the AGC system with three redundant IBM AP101 guidance computers. By this point it was the mid-1970s, and digital computing had advanced sufficiently for more specialised alternatives to be available. The system was tested for additional failure modes that may affect aircraft over their entire surface life. A prominent example was that of lightning. A lightning strike is one of the few predictable occurrences that could potentially knock out an entire bank of redundant computers. The team therefore built a lightning simulator and subject the airframe to various high voltage spikes to simulate a strike. Not only did they conclude that a strike was exceedingly unlikely to disable the entire fly-by-wire system, but they also provided recommendations to shield electronics against strikes in future aircraft in a 150-word report. I particularly like the following line from the report. Quote, At all times, the airframe was solidly grounded and personnel could touch the aircraft without danger of being shocked, even when simulated lightning current was flowing. End quote. I, I have no doubt this was incredibly safe, but still... Ugh. The Phase 2 configuration took the project from a feasibility demo to a practical demonstration of a system that could be used in an operational role. This phase is beyond the scope of this video, and it carried on for more than a decade actually, and it was used to develop the fly-by-wire system for the Space Shuttle before the program was concluded. The final cost was $12 million, or about $65 million in 2023 money. Considering the prevalence of fly-by-wire in today's global commercial and military fleet, this has to represent an incredible return on investment. Something else out of the scope of this presentation is the fate of the third F-8 acquired by Dryden. It was modified to form the supercritical wing experiment. This studied the effects of supersonic flow on a new aerofoil design, known as a supercritical aerofoil. I can confidently say this is not something I will do in detail in a future video, because remember, my knowledge of supersonic flow regimes is limited. But the supercritical wing aircraft is often seen in tandem with the digital flyby wire aircraft in archive videos and photos. And if you're wondering about that fourth F-8, that was kept in its original state for pilot training and familiarisation, 
pilots would fly it before they graduated, if you like, to the test aircraft. Shortly after the beginning of Phase 2, the F-16 was rolled out. This was the first mass-produced fly-by-wire controlled aircraft. Certainly the first mass-produced digital fly-by-wire controlled aircraft anyway. It had been designed closely in tandem with the Dryden team. And in 1988, Airbus introduced the A320, the first digital fly-by-wire controlled civilian airliner. Complete fly-by-wire failures are incredibly rare due to good quality control, redundancy, and robust fault tolerance planning. This would require an entire video to cover, but it's worth spending a little time covering the basics of fault tolerance. The F-8 fly-by-wire phase 2 system used three independent flight computers, all connected to a common voter. This voter unit was comparatively simple and would pass the majority decision from the three computers. So we can have two computers fail and still fly, right? Not quite. A failure doesn't just mean the computer goes completely dead. A computer sending erroneous signals to the control surfaces is a failure too, and one that could occur due to hardware or software issues. That's why we have the voter to make sure such erroneous signals are discarded for correct ones. So, if one computer fails, we still have two outputs feeding into the voter. As long as these two outputs are correct, we're fine. However, if one of the remaining computers fails, there's no majority vote to take. The voter can no longer make a choice, and a control loss would be likely in this case, as the voter is equally likely to pick the erroneous outputs as it is the correct ones. So, adding two spare flight computers only actually gives us a single level of redundancy. This is a one-fail-operate system. Of course, when considering the computers independently, a double failure is incredibly unlikely. However, if they're identical systems, then their identical hardware and software could cause a common failure. In the case of combat aircraft, it's more feasible for combat damage to affect two computers at once. And there are other external or maybe even unforeseen factors that could feasibly make failures non-independent. To combat this, sometimes we can use entirely separate architectures for the different computers to reduce the chance of common failures. This triplex system also has a single point of failure, the voter itself. Now, although this is a very simple component, theoretically built from just a few logic gates, it's still a potential single point of failure. A more robust system may use a separate voter for each set of control surfaces. So one voter for the ailerons, one for the elevators, one for the rudder. In such a case, no single voter failure can cause a complete loss of control. Though we'd probably look to add redundant voters for the elevators, at least. Quadruplex systems extend these concepts further by adding an additional computer. Now we can tolerate two computer failures and still fly the aircraft. This two-fail-operate architecture was used in the Space Shuttle, in addition to a fifth completely independent system that was isolated from the quadruplexed machines. The next extension is just to do away with the voter completely. Rather than have a dedicated unit to determine the majority decision, just allow the computers to exchange results with each other. Through some clever control flow, two or more computers in agreement can disable an, an erroneous machine. They can even reboot it and try and diagnose the error in some cases. Of course, that requires extremely meticulous coding practices, but with a trusted certification body, it's perfectly possible to devise a robust series of algorithms to ensure the computers are able to reach agreement. Now that just covers the basic concepts. Modern airliners extend further on these, sometimes using separate systems for roll, pitch and yaw, and with more consideration to other failure modes that I haven't possibly got the time to go into here. And I've not even gone into redundant power supplies that feed fly-by-wire systems. That's a whole other topic entirely.
I'm not sure there will be any of you, but for any viewers that have made it this far and still insist on statements like, I just feel safer with a physically connected mechanical control system. If I haven't persuaded you that you are wrong by now, I never will. But Airbus recently released a statistical analysis report of commercial aviation accidents from 1958 to present day. It's really difficult to get a good estimate on exactly how much safer fly-by-wire has made airliners, as there are so many confounding variables. However, Airbus's report covers four generations of commercial aircraft. Only Gen 4 aircraft have fly-by-wire. Here is the fatal accident rate per million flying hours for the four generations of airliner. Note it's a 10-year moving average, so data only starts 10 years after the type was introduced. So the uh, A320 with fly-by-wire was introduced in 1988, hence the data starting from 1998 here. With the exception of their first year of operation, fly-by-wire equipped Gen 4 aircraft have had a significantly lower fatality rate than non-fly-by-wire enabled generations. Their current fatality rate is about one third of Gen 3 aircraft. Here's the rate for loss of control incidents from 2002 to present day. Remember, most fly-by-wire related incidents will fall under this category. The rate is one eighth of that in fly-by-wire enabled aircraft when compared to the previous generation. And for anyone screaming at me about the 737 MAX incidents, the fact you can even name individual fly-by-wire related incidents demonstrates how rare they are. There were many design and procedural failures that caused those, but the most abhorrent was a breakdown in the FAA certification process. Putting aside Boeing's repeated technical failures, the inability of the FAA to enforce their own process was the final failure, which allowed those incidents to occur in the first place. The incidents were, for want of a better phrase, an impressive screw-up on the part of both Boeing and the FAA, but such incidents are very much the exception. Though, as I stressed earlier, it's difficult to compare the performance of the AGC with other systems, it's generally quoted as having similar general purpose compute performance to the desktops of the late 1970s, such as the Apple II. So, it's probably not a far stretch to say it's responsible for the world having access to cheap desktop computing 10 years before they would have otherwise. And that's one of the commonly quoted benefits that NASA gave us, the personal computer. But the AGC also gave us digital fly-by-wire. It wasn't hidden behind corporate secrecy, and it wasn't owned by NASA only to be licensed out at a cost. It was made public to everyone. Yes, it allows the military to more efficiently kill people, but like it or not, if you're watching this from a NATO or a NATO-aligned country, part of the reason you can live your life the way you do is thanks to an effective defence strategy. I don't like it. I wish it didn't have to be that way, but it is. Maybe one day that'll change. But back to how does NASA affect me? Fly-by-wire made and continues to make flying safer for everyone. And that is a true gift to the world. Thank you very much for watching.